in. So we're in Acts chapter 10, verse uh, uh, 24. We're actually going to uh, go on and uh, survey a little bit uh, the first 18 verses of chapter 11. Uh, the message is entitled, The Gospel to the Whole World, because this is what happens uh, through Peter going to the home of Cornelius. We kind of have this breakthrough uh, we're going to see in uh, Peter's own mind. <laughs> he really he doesn't know what's going on other than he had this vision, this trance, and God is telling him to do something, and he's just doing it. He's going to go all the way down to the house of Cornelius, and it isn't in a way he's there. Uh, he's going to ask him, so why did you call me? But he's going to have the little light go off in his head. We'll see that in a couple of uh, key words and, uh, and phrases and so forth. He'll finally get it and preach the gospel, and uh, there'll be a, a tremendous re a response. <laughs> but um, he had, as we said last week, they have an attitude adjustment. God uh, used uh, his environment. He's used the... Uh, uh, several other things in terms of uh, uh, the gospel coming uh, to the Gentile world, and, uh, and uh, this will be uh, an exciting uh, passage for us. Why don't we uh, have a word of prayer? Father, we just uh, are so thankful that uh, we've come to know uh, the gospel, that somebody shared it with us, that somebody didn't look at us and think that uh, we look different, we act different, and for some reason they, uh, they passed us by, Lord, but... Uh, we're so thankful that we've come to know your love and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, uh, we just pray we have that same heart for others around us. May we have that same revelation uh, that the Apostle Peter had uh, here in the first century. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to do something uh, because I meant, I just want to say welcome home, Jack. And uh, Jack just returned from Iraq. I think he was working at the Hilton or something over there. I'm not really sure, but uh, uh, praise the Lord. We're, uh, we're, we're thankful you're, you're home safe and safe and sound. Praise the Lord. All right. I want to show you a little, a little slide of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. If you're not familiar with, uh, with him, he is a father, considered the father of uh, the uh, uh, India nation. Uh, and, uh, and again, he returns to uh, India uh, in 1914, he spends uh, uh, a lot of time in England uh, studying uh, the, some of the leading universities there, studying as an attorney, studying the law. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, he uh, becomes very interested in, in Christianity. Again, if you picture, you know, uh, you know late uh, 1800s, uh, what Great Britain might have been like in terms of the uh, Christianity there at the time. Very different than today, of course. He becomes uh, very interested in Christianity, reading the New Testament uh, and so forth, uh, and, uh, and decides that he would, uh, you know, check out uh, one of the churches there in London. Uh, and as he uh, approached the door and went inside, uh, an usher approached him, uh, basically, uh, and said, uh, re refused to seat him uh, and said to him, uh, you should go elsewhere to worship uh, with those of your own people. Uh, and, of course, uh, he responded in his autobiography by saying, if Christians have a, a caste, have a caste differences also, uh, I might as well remain a Hindu. He thought that Christianity uh, would be the greatest thing that could ever come to India, to his own culture, uh, because of the caste system there. People are locked in by name uh, and by lineage, uh, and they cannot escape or ever uh, move upward from it uh, at all. Uh, he thought Christianity would solve all of those issues, uh, the idea of the love of God through Jesus Christ. Uh, he investigates, but he's turned away at the door because he looks a little bit differently uh, than those that, that were in that church on that day because he spoke with a, a slightly, probably a little, they would say a better British accent than those in London uh, at, uh, at that time, uh, and he's turned away. But what a difference it would have made. Uh, he goes to South Africa, works for 20 years as an attorney helping uh, immigrant workers. He eventually returns to uh, India uh, again in 1914 uh, and for the next 30-something years works through civil disobedience to rid the country of the occupation of the uh, uh, British government that had been imposed on them uh, through what we know as colonialism. That's accomplished and he's there on the scene in his older years in uh, 1947. Uh, a guy that spoke to billions of people. What a voice. Uh, he could have had for the gospel if some, if some guy uh, wasn't like Peter, wasn't like Peter in our text, uh, and be able to see that the gospel is for every, every person. 
And uh, certainly it took a, a bit of, a, as we said, an attitude adjustment for Peter. God's been working on his heart, not just in that vision, but in the environment. Years before preaching in Samaria, uh, and it, it's taken a lot. And we're going to still see that uh, uh, God's got a ways to go in the heart of Peter, but uh, we're going to see the gospel come to the whole world here. Uh, let's look at the reception that he receives uh, here in the home of Cornelius, verse 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Uh, then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for, I asked them, For what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore... We are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. So five uh, aspects or things we want to point out about this uh, uh, reception. Uh, again, all predicated on the vision of Cornelius and, or a visitation really by an angel. Uh, and then the uh, vis vision or the trance that Peter has on the rooftop of uh, Simon the Tanner. Uh, again, the reception had to be witnessed, we'd first say. Uh, Simon, uh, Peter's going to go up there. Uh, and uh, he's got to be more than uh, a little concerned. Now, he's, he's seen the vision of the animals, clean and unclean, uh, and, uh, and again, we, we pointed out the fact that he, he gets it in terms of, uh, this is not about whether he's going to eat kosher or not, uh, it's about uh, who the gospel would go to. That's very clear by Peter's remarks uh, uh, here in this text and as uh, others that we'll read in chapter 11. Uh, it's not about his diet, it's about accepting people. He uh, repeats the, uh, the uh, vision or the dream three times, something about Peter and three times, and uh, for Peter to get it. Uh, and of course, then the uh, words as uh, he kind of comes out of that dream or trance, uh, you know, there's men coming at the door, go greet them, go welcome them, uh, which, uh, which he does. And the amazing thing is we saw last week, he actually welcomed them right into uh, his home there with Simon the Tanner. Uh, and of course, now he has uh, followed them uh, and they have led him back to the home of Cornelius. But he doesn't go uh, without some other Jewish believers to witness what's going on, uh, just in case. Uh, and, of course, it does happen that Peter gets called in on the carpet for what he has done in preaching the gospel there. He needs two guys. He takes six. He takes three times the number of witnesses that he, that he actually, uh, actually needs. It's uh, 30 miles, uh, a two-day journey. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a bit of apprehension uh, in the heart of uh, Peter, uh, and he is in unchartered territory in what he's about ready to do. And uh, as we said last time, he is uh, trusting the Lord in all of his ways. He's not leaning on his own understanding. He's just trusting God to uh, direct him. Uh, again, uh, probably a little bit of anxiety. He makes his way there. And of course, secondly, the reception included Cornelius bowing at his feet, uh, and it's certainly uh, an astounding response. The Greek here is he uh, falls in reference, proskuneo, which means to kiss towards, sometimes used of uh, offering homage to a deity, to angels, and sometimes men. And of course, this is the leader of the oppressive military occupying force uh, that was in Israel at, uh, uh, at that time, uh, the Romans. Peter grows up in Galilee. Uh, he's grown up seeing uh, probably a lot of abuse uh, by the Romans, by the Roman military and so forth in his own country. Uh, he was probably right in there with the other guys hoping Jesus would lead to an overthrow and the establishment of, uh, of their kingdom and so forth. Uh, the, uh, we'd say this scene is ripe for Peter's prejudice to just burst onto the scene uh, with, uh, with this guy, but he doesn't. He says, you know what, I'm only a man. He says, kind of, kind of get up here, you know. Uh, and uh, we see a humility uh, on both of these men's part, but uh, quite the reception. Third, it included uh, Peter witnessing the faith of, of uh, Cornelius uh, himself. Uh, again, 
Uh, Cornelius could have said when he comes in the door, I'm a Roman centurion. How fitting it is for you, fisherman, peasant, preacher, to come to my home at my command today. He, he could have said that, but, he, but he, he doesn't at all. He says instead in verse, uh, verse 30, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And then it happened. Here's a guy that's been fasting and in prayer for four days. Uh, we talk about Cornelius being a seeker of truth and a seek or after God. This is not somebody who's just kind of say, well, God, if you're up there, you know, I want to show up. That's okay with me. That's, that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, this guy's pretty, uh, pretty serious, pretty dedicated. And then verse 27, uh, notice that uh, uh, his family and friends, uh, he went in and found many uh, who had come together. Uh, this uh, language indicates it's a pretty good crowd. It's a pretty good crowd uh, that's uh, that's there. You know, kind of think this through with me for a minute. I mean, you, you know, he uh, he gets the vision, uh, sin for Peter, uh, and and, uh, and they're going to tell you what you've been waiting to hear. Now we're going to find out that what he's hoping is they're going to find out how they can be forgiven of their sins. Uh, that, that's going to come out in the text. So they, they head off down the road, and this guy begins collecting people into his to his home. He's going to be ready ready for the first harvest crusade. <laughs> it's like, hey, you want to know how you can be forgiven of your sins? Come to my house. When? Right now. When's it going to happen? I don't know. We're just waiting. You know, uh, probably a couple days, you know, a couple, three days. But we're just going to come and wait uh, because God's bringing somebody to us uh, to give us the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it's not like once those guys left Peter's home, uh, the other uh, Roman soldier that went with him uh, pulled out his uh, phone and like text him. We're on the way about six hours out, you know. Uh, it, it's not like, hey, okay, now's the time. Come. These guys had to pretty much come to the guy's house and kind of camp out, uh, just hoping they'd get some word uh, of the gospel. So when Peter shows up, this, uh, this had to be impressive. The guy meets him at the door and bows to him when he comes in. Hey, man, I, I'm, I'm only a man here. And then he walks into a, probably what was a typical Roman home. It's a courtyard area, and it's pretty packed uh, with, uh, with people. Peter's probably thinking, where all these people get here, you know, and he still doesn't even know what he's going to say. You know, we, we saw that uh, uh, in the text. But the uh, fourth thing is a reception included an announcement that certainly was, uh, was good news. It was good news before we even got to the gospel. Verse 28, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That was the result of the vision. As Peter was pondering the vision, what it meant, that was the conclusion that he came to. Uh, that was the big uh, statement there uh, that uh, everybody should be able to receive the gospel. <clears throat> Again, for uh, centuries, um, Jews, based on the Old Testament law, considered Gentiles to be unclean, uh, very often re being referred to as the Gentile dog. So uh, I, I don't, you know, there's a lot of different ways we could liken this experience to people today. Uh, but certainly a, a similar thing to what we mentioned in terms of Mahatma Gandhi and how uh, he was uh, you know, uh, uh, not allowed to come into a Christian church uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, we thank the, the Lord for how the gospel has now gone uh, around the world. But, uh, man, it, uh, it wasn't over and done with in terms of uh, Christians' prejudices uh, against other people that were different from them. It didn't end right here in this chapter. Uh, and the Jew-Gentile thing be, uh, culminates in chapter 15 that we'll get to. It was a big deal. It uh, would have prevented the gospel going to the whole world. Verse 29, I asked them, for what reason have you sent me? So uh, Peter, again, doesn't really know yet uh, what's going to happen, the outcome. We, all, we read this and we know the end of the story over there. Peter, Peter has no idea what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, going on, which you have to appreciate, you know, from Peter. It's just like, sometimes God does that. I need you to follow me. Where? I'll show you when we get there. What for? I'll tell you when we get there. Well, what's going to happen? I'll let you know later. You know, it's sometimes that's the way the Lord leads, you know, and it's just a matter of whether we're going to uh, uh, obey, obey or not. I just, I, I just I have to tell you this one story. There's, uh, you know, at Calvary Costa Mesa, there's a school of ministry. Uh, and these guys are learning about how to do ministry and so forth, get some practical training for some of the guys on staff uh, there and everything. There's a hilarious story about one of the guys uh, that, uh, you know, really seeking the Lord, one obedient to the Lord. And, and uh, he, uh, you know, I guess taking the bus back and forth to the church, a uh, young guy, and uh, felt uh, a crazy impression uh, to uh, preach the gospel uh, when he got off the bus. The problem was he really felt the Lord was leading to preach the gospel to a particular mailbox. 
I uh, thought that was a little unusual, prayed about it several times, still felt convinced that, okay, maybe it's like good practice, I'll just, who cares, there's no one around, I'll just give it a shot, maybe the Lord wants me to practice preaching the gospel, preaches the gospel to the mailbox, and a guy jumps out behind the hedge and said, I've just been praying that if someone bring me the gospel, then I know that God's alive, and anyway, leads the guy to the Lord. You know, sometimes God asks us to do some very strange things. Uh, and this is very strange what, what Peter is doing. He doesn't even know why he's there yet. Uh, and uh, we would say, fifthly, Peter's reception included hearing Cornelius' first hand account of this visitation by, by the angel. Uh, and uh, uh, very interesting because uh, Cornelius the Gentile uh, gets a visitation by an angel. Uh, the apostle Peter gets a, a vision or a dream or, or, or a trance. And, uh, and, of course, the visitation explained the dream. The dream uh, explained the, uh, the vis visitation. Uh, over in chapter 11, uh, it says, uh, verse 13, Call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Uh, that's, uh, Peter comes to understand that uh, uh, that's part of why he's there. Uh, he's not there to go give Cornelius and his family and friends a lecture on Judaism, uh, they wanted some hope for their lives. They wanted to be rightly related to God. They wanted to be uh, forgiven of their sins. Uh, one writer said, the seeking Savior will find the seeking sinner. And uh, Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And certainly Cornelius was a guy that was seeking. Uh, again, not just kind of in a flippant way. The guy's been fasting and praying for four days. Uh, he's a man of uh, tremendous integrity. Uh, and uh, a lot of responsibility, uh, very generous with the Jewish people and so forth, some of the other things we've learned about him, but definitely uh, seeking uh, after the Lord. Uh, which again, uh, brings us to this point in our own cultural climate uh, and those people that would say, you know, if someone is sincere and they're sincerely seeking after God, it doesn't really matter what name they use to call upon, what religion they are in, as long as they are sincere. Who are you to impose your own cultural restrictions and religious ideas upon a people from another group? But that's exactly what Peter is doing here. Uh, and Cornelius had come to the conclusion uh, that uh, even though uh, he knew about Judaism, even though he knew about the one true God, he still had no way to be forgiven uh, of his sins. Uh, it's like the guy that uh, we sometimes illustrate by seeing a, a guy is, uh, uh, is dying because he is... Uh, uh, he has taken some poison. There's an antidote to the poison, uh, but he has to be willing to take it to save his life. Uh, you arrive on the scene in time to give him the antidote for uh, the poison so that he can be saved. Uh, and he says, uh, I'm not sure if I like the label on the bottle. Well, the label has nothing to do with it. If you don't take this, you'll die. I've seen other people handing out the antidote, and I believe they're hypocrites. Well, that, great. That has nothing to do with it. You can either take it and be saved or, or, uh, or not. Well, even if I recover, what will be the side effects? I don't know that I really want it to alter my lifestyle. You're dying. Do you want the antidote or not? So that's us giving out the gospel. and Some of the objections that are actually absurd when we think about the consequences of sin and rejecting uh, Jesus Christ. But Cornelius and as many people as he could get into his household apparently were there and they wanted to hear about how they could receive forgiveness of sins. Uh, secondly, it's not, not just the reception, but it's a new revelation that allows Peter to share the gospel. And it's been progressive. It's been going on, but it kind of really pops on the scene here in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, pre preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to, uh, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God. 
even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is, uh, it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Kind of a short little sermon there, probably 20, 25 seconds, but uh, that was enough apparently. Uh, and it really contains uh, all the truth uh, of the gospel in it. But uh, notice first in verse 34 when he says, in truth I perceive, that's, that's a very key word that God shows no partiality. Uh, it means uh, uh, that uh, you know, the, the light has gone off. He realizes what's going on. I get it now is, is the idea. In other words, it's just kind of, you know, God's been working and he shows up there and he sees all these guys and they're, you know, the, uh, the attitude, the faith of them and so forth. He, the words start coming out of his mouth and he finally gets it. Uh, what, uh, what the vision, what the dream, what the visitation by the angel were all about. And then it says he should show no partiality. This is a term that's used from the uh, Roman court system. When someone came in to appear before a Roman judge, sometimes the judge would simply look at the man's face and determine whether he was guilty or, uh, or innocent. Uh, they, a, a literal translation is uh, a face taker. He takes the man's face and, and basically says, uh, you've got an honest look in your eye. You're, you're innocent. Or sure look like a criminal to me. You're guilty. And, uh, and Roman judges would do that uh, on occasion. Uh, and God is telling Peter, don't you do that. Don't you look at someone. And because of their looks, you determine some kind of judgment upon them that they would be open to the gospel or not open to the gospel or that you could share the gospel or that they might respond to the gospel. He says, don't you do that. And of course, you know, that's the message for us as well, because it can be our tendency. Uh, you know, you know, we could walk out in the parking lot today and the guy next to you is on, on a Harley with his uh, little leather vest and his uh, black uh, skull bandana tied around his head. And you probably aren't going, that's a guy that needs the gospel. Let me to him. But, you know, that's kind of what God is saying here. We have a tendency to pigeonhole and think that, well, we can only share with people that are kind of more like us, whatever that is, uh, age or whatever it might be. Uh, or that uh, somehow we know who's receptive to the gospel and, uh, uh, and who isn't. Uh, and it's certainly a lesson we need to learn. God does not show favoritism. There is no partiality, a big revelation to Peter. Look at verse 35. Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. That was the big revelation. The person that fears God and works righteous. Righteousness. What is it to work righteous? Well, it's to receive the gospel. Uh, the disciples, uh, some people said to Jesus one time, uh, what is the works that we must do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, the work singular that you must do is to believe on him uh, whom has sent me. Romans 10, Paul says in verse 14, how then uh, shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. <laughs> the NIV, again, a thought by thought translation says, consequently, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. The faith is saving faith or salvation. It's not faith uh, genetically, generically. Uh, how can I grow in my faith? Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Just read your Bible more. That might be true. That's not what this text is saying. How are people saved? Uh, they are saved. They receive saving faith by hearing a message. What's the message? The message concerning Jesus Christ. In terms of his death and his resurrection, that's how people, people are saved. Uh, when it comes to sin and salvation, uh, we would say there is no difference. Peter is finally getting this new revelation. It prompts him, we would say then, to share the gospel with this group. Verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, uh, he is Lord of all. Of course, then he, he goes through uh, this little mini sermon. We, we could take it and make a very good gospel tract uh, out of it, just in summary. He made it clear that Israel was God's instrument for accomplishing his work, but not just to Israel, because he says Jesus is Lord of all, not just the Lord of the Jewish people, not just the Lord of Israel, uh, but the Lord of all people. And then, of course, he preaches the, the death of Christ on the cross. 
It is in previous sermons, uh, as in Stephen's sermons, uh, the, uh, basically the culpability for the death of Jesus is laid squarely at the foot of the leadership there uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, but either way, Jesus was uh, crucified here on a tree or the idea on a cross. And then he preaches the resurrection, verse 40. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Uh, and then, of course, goes on, and we're witnesses of all this. We ate with him. We hung out with him. Uh, and he has sent us to, uh, to preach the gospel or announce the good news. Uh, and, uh, and here's the bottom line. Whoever believes in him uh, will receive remission of sins. And apparently... That was all these guys were waiting to hear because the Holy Spirit, as we'll go on in our text, the Holy Spirit interrupts. In other words, Peter, is still, he's into his next line, and all of a sudden this whole thing happens where the Holy Spirit falls on them, uh, and uh, they are going to have an experience that is outward, so it would be obvious to everyone they just got saved. And uh, uh, that's what they were waiting to hear. Is there a way? Jesus is Lord of all. And that sounds good to me so far, but what about salvation? It's in faith. Who's it for? Whosoever. Anybody. Anybody that believes. And this whole household of Cornelius apparently gets saved. Friends uh, and families. Again, this is not a, a, a message uh, about Peter. It's a message uh, about Christ. He's only the messenger. He's the, the mailman sometimes we say. And that's our responsibility as well. He has commanded us to preach. Uh, that's what Peter says. And in the same way, uh, we say, well, isn't that what you're doing, Pastor Tim? Well, it's actually just delivering the gospel, uh, getting the gospel out to people that they might hear the message. Why? Because, well, we just, we don't know who's open. We don't know who will receive. And there's a lot of people we share, and they're not open, and we start praying with them, and we, uh, we try to show them love. We try to do acts of mercy. We try to live our lives before them to establish some credibility so it may be even a later date we can share with them again. But, you know, there are people like Cornelius out there that, they're just kind of waiting to hear. They're just waiting for somebody to tell them uh, how, that, uh, how they can know Christ and be forgiven. But the thing is, <laughs> they might be that person is the most unlikely person you ever think you'd share the gospel with. Uh, and yet, uh, that's Peter's experience here. One more element to his message, that's in verse 42, uh, where he says that uh, he was uh, ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Wow, pretty heavy, Peter. So in this gospel, he's got the gospel is for everybody. He is Lord of all. Uh, his, uh, his death, uh, his resurrection, uh, it, you can receive remission of sins. It's for whosoever, it's for anybody. And by the way, did I mention that if you don't receive him, you're going to be judged by him. Uh, Paul says in preaching, on the only sermon that we've got of Paul preaching to a Gentile crowd says, in the past, God overlooks such ignorance, but now he has commanded all people everywhere to repent for he said a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this by raising him from the dead. Jesus is the judge. In the end, people are going to all have to stand before him. And when they do, they're going to confess his name. They're going to bow his knee, their knee to him. That's what uh, Paul says writing to the church at Philippi. Uh, there in chapter 2, verse 9. Therefore God has also has highly exalted him. <coughs> And given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everybody's going to do it, uh, but some of us are going to be going, hallelujah, and we're going to get a big hug right after that, you know, and just be embraced by the Lord, and uh, it's just going to be awesome. There's other people that are going to stand at a thing called the white throne judgment. Everybody is condemned already. Everybody out there apart from Christ, we could literally say, is the walking dead. They are dead in their trespasses and sin. There is no hope for them apart from Christ. Uh, and one day they will die. And one day they will uh, be before the white throne judgment. They are condemned already. It's not going to be like, well, weigh your good against the bad. No, everybody is condemned already. Jesus said, I've not come into the world to condemn the world, but save the world from its sins because it's already condemned. But they will be judged. And they will be sentenced. It's a sentencing. How deep and dark and torturous a place in hell will they go? Uh, and that's what that's going to be all about. And that's part of the gospel as well. Certainly, the, the, if we understand the consequences of rejecting, sometimes it helps people make a decision to receive him rather than reject him. 
I don't suggest starting off with that part. I believe you're going to hell one day. You're going to be tortured forever for all your sins. My name's Tim. Very nice to meet you. I, I, I don't know that uh, that's the way you lead into the thing, uh, but Peter's not pulling any punches here uh, either. Jesus talked a lot more about hell than he did about heaven. Uh, it's, uh, it's a reality. Uh, we don't like to talk about it. Uh, one uh, writer said that uh, if you preach a sermon on hell, make sure you got a tear in your eye. Uh, because, but that is, that is our understanding. I think messages on hell are meant for the church, not so much for the unbeliever, because the Bible says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. So we emphasize the love of God, the grace of God, how good he is, what he does, transforms our, our lives from what they were and, uh, in heaven uh, in the future. What a, what, a, what a glorious thing to know the Lord and to be forgiven and have a clear conscience and so forth. These are the things we want to share. Uh, but it is a reality also. I think we need to be reminded of if, uh, what's going to happen if we don't get the gospel out. Uh, and certainly, he is the judge of the living uh, and the dead. Now, I want to take just a few minutes now uh, and uh, go through a couple of passages of Scripture. You may be familiar with them. Uh, maybe not. We call them the Romans Road. And uh, uh, in the back of your Bible, there's some blank white pages. And uh, you've always wondered, why do they put those there? It's for this. So you can write them down in the back. I don't know if I'll remember it. You won't. That's why you write them down in the back of your Bible. What if I'm sharing with somebody? What do I share with them? The things you're going to write down in the back of the Bible. Now, this normally takes uh, 90 minutes. Uh, it's an evangelistic seminar. I only charge $19.95, but it's free today. <laughs> And I'm going to try to go through it in just about four or five minutes. But uh, actually, if you take, a, if, really, if you take a class on evangelism and uh, how to lead someone to the Lord, you're, you're going to go through something like this at some point, uh, point in time. So let's get practical here. Uh, first one is Romans 3.23. So just write Romans 3.23. You can look at it later. I think I've probably got it for you on the screen. Very simply, when we're going through Romans, one of Paul's summary statements, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, he's... He's already gone through the religious person, the non-religious person. Everybody's got a clear witness of God, an external witness of the creator, an internal witness of the conscience. Uh, but uh, the bottom line, people need to come to the conclusion uh, that they need to be forgiven. Uh, it, uh, <clears throat> I can tell you from sur surfing on the North Shore in my younger days and being out there and kind of, you know, I never really called out for a lifeguard unless I thought I was really dying. You know, I thought I was really downing. Yeah. The, unfortunately, the one time I did that, I was too f far offshore, and so no, nobody could see me. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you got as a young surfer, you got to really humble yourself to like scream for help. I'm just, I'm just telling you that. And that's the way. You know, people have to come to that, humbling themselves and seeing that they need to be forgiven. Uh, and you know, you can go through the Ten Commandments. Uh, uh, you know, you can do uh, a lot of different things. But you're, we pray for the Holy Spirit to convict people of their sin. Uh, so that when we deliver the gospel, they're like Cornelius. They don't need to be convinced. Uh, but some people sometimes do. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody needs salvation, in other words. In the Romans 6, 23, uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Uh, what we earn from our sin is death. Uh, what Jesus sets us free from is sin, death, and hell, and, and we get uh, eternal life in him. What is eternal life? It's the free gift of God. There's the bad news and the good news. You should have with the bad news. All of sin and come sure of the glory of God. Then you give them the bad news and the good news. You know, the wages of sin is death. Well, that's bad. But uh, the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. It's a gift? Yes, it's freely, freely given. Well, how do I get it? Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 to 10. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess uh, and are saved. That's how people are saved. Uh, they have to confess with their mouth uh, that they need a Savior. Uh, sometimes why we have them pray what we call a sinner's prayer. Just to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. Please forgive me. Please come into my heart. Have them confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in their heart that God raised him uh, from the dead. Uh, that's the free gift of eternal life. Uh, we don't earn it. We don't have to get better. I, I grew up in a, in a church where I grew up believing, right or wrong, I, you know, but some, uh, my child mind or whatever, believing that uh, you had to get it together to become a Christian. Uh, you had to be able to keep the standards of that particular denomination 
or you couldn't be a, a Christian. I had it all backwards. Uh, God's not waiting for anybody to clean their act up. He just says, come. Uh, and then he does the work uh, internally. Uh, Romans 3.12, uh, you can use as an invitation. It's a very simple one. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now, you know, from Revelation, this is actually said Jesus to a church, to Christians. Christians that have uh, uh, so uh, uh, departed from the gospel and the word of God and so forth that Jesus is on the outside saying, anybody home, I'd sure like to come in if you'll open the door. Uh, but it's certainly it's still appropriate application to be able to say that someone who doesn't know the Lord, it's like this. It's like Jesus is knocking, but he'll never force his way in. Uh, you'll have to open that door uh, and allow him to come uh, into your heart. Four simple scriptures, uh, you, can, uh, you can lead anybody to the Lord. And it might be someone you never thought you would lead to the Lord. That's, that's our whole point. Because the gospel is for the whole world. Uh, God does not show favoritism at all. He's not a face taker. He doesn't just look and judge people by the outward and neither should we. Well, let's go on to the, uh, the results of this. Peter's witness uh, uh, witnesses the, uh, the results of the outpouring of the Spirit of God here in verse 44 to 48. While Peter was still speaking these words... The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, uh, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, uh, and as many as came with Peter, uh, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they had heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water, that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized. In the name of the Lord, then they asked him to stay a, a few days. So three results. One is that the other, again, the Jewish believers, these six witnesses that he's brought with him, they're shocked. <laughs> because rabbis taught in the first century, a Gentile could not receive the Holy Spirit. They all knew it, but that's not what they're seeing. So their, their theology is being rocked here by what, uh, what God is, uh, is doing. The second result is you have the... Uh, Cornelius and those in his household uh, speaking in tongues and praising God. What's the combination we see throughout the New Testament? When there is a reference to what's transpiring, uh, what's being heard is always uh, a praise uh, to God, uh, and, uh, and they're magnifying God here, the text uh, says. Uh, now, you know, there's several things that are interesting about this, and one is that um, uh, this is exactly what happened uh, in the book of Acts and Acts 2. I think it's replicated by God here, so there would be no denying to these six men uh, that are with Peter, as well as Peter himself, that I get it. I think they got saved. They are having the same exact experience that we had uh, there on the day uh, of Pentecost, and that becomes uh, obvious to them. Uh, the other thing, though, that is interesting to note that is uh, G. Campbell Morgan uh, said uh, that uh, he makes reference to the, the, in the book of Acts, the regularity of the irregularity of the work of the Holy Spirit. God's not, you can't put them in a box and say, it's always going to happen this way. Uh, with the apostles themselves in, in uh, John chapter 20, uh, Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. We would say that they were born again. When Jesus, the Son of God, stands on you and breathes on you and says, receive the Holy Spirit, we're pretty sure they received the Holy Spirit and, uh, at that point. But yet he says to them later, but you wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In that upper room discourse in John, he said, the Holy Spirit has been with you, but he will be in you. Every believer, when we pray to receive Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in us and dwells in us. Uh, and for the primary purpose of conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ, we with all unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. And we're being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit, Paul says to, to the church of Corinth. Uh, so that happens to every believer. What we see with the apostles, then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Different Greek preposition. He was with. He's been in. He will come upon you for the purpose of being a witness. A dynamic power that you don't have in your lives. You will have. Wait until Jerusalem. That happens in uh, Acts chapter, chapter 2. So different workings of the Holy Spirit. These guys, it's completely different. Uh, they, they, they hear the gospel. Uh, they can be saved. 
I'm one of those whosoevers. That sounds good to me. They believe in their heart uh, that God can save them, and they're saved uh, and instantaneously. They're also, notice it says the Holy Spirit came upon them, uh, and they're obviously baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they speak in a language they do not know. They don't understand it, uh, but those who could understand it, uh, they, were, uh, they were praising God. Uh, so we'd say this is certainly not the typical experience. Uh, does this kind of thing still happen? Once in a while. I've only met one guy, though, that this happened to. I was doing a, a wedding for uh, one of the folks in the church. They were marrying another guy from a different church, and we were doing the wedding together, me and the other pastor. We're, we're doing just kind of hanging out uh, at, uh, you know, the rehearsal time and stuff, kind of sharing our testimonies and kind of getting to know each other. And, uh, and uh, anyway, when he shared his testimony, this is what happened. He went forward to an altar call, went to pray to the Lord, and then as he was praying to receive the Lord, he began to speak in a language that he, that he did not know. Uh, it still, still does happen. We'd say it's highly uh, unusual, but it, but it does happen. You got the Apostle Paul saved on the Damascus Road. You got Ananias that comes to pray for him there on Straight Street in Damascus, lays his hands on him. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. We have no mention of him speaking in tongues or anything else, but we have a subsequent time when he's writing the church in Corinth and says, by the way, I speak in tongues more than you all. When did that happen? We don't know. It must happen at a subsequent time. All to say, we just can't put God in a box. But we, it's very obvious God had them have this experience so, so it would, uh, everybody would know in, in that room what just happened. It's like, wow, these guys are all saved, uh, which uh, led to the third results. Peter saying, I'm pretty sure we should go ahead and baptize these guys, uh, which, uh, which they do. Now, in chapter 11, we're just going to highlight a few uh, verses here because uh, Peter had to know in taking these guys with him that he's going to get called in on the carpet because as a good kosher Jew, he actually, well, he actually went into a Gentile home. Uh, he actually went and ate with them. So he, he you know, this is inevitable what, what happens here in chapter 11. Verse 1 to 3 says, uh, as we're saying, Peter's required to give an account. The apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into the uncircumcised men and ate with them. That means they're not real thrilled with him when it says they are contended with him. That's a very polite word, isn't it? <clears throat> Why don't you step over here? I'd like to contend with you for a few moments. Uh, uh, we'd say first he's required to give an account because he ate with them. Uh, obviously, that's that's their big um, say. That's their big beef here. The uh, uh, he's uh, and they're shocked. And th this is a shocking thing. Peter's never done this in a life. He never dreamt he'd ever do this in his life. Uh, but here he is. These guys get get saved, and uh, it's like wow. He baptizing them. Well, we might have left some to eat. What do you got that's kosher? Nothing. You know, okay, well, let's eat anyway. I, I, you know, we just can't, we can't even imagine in, uh, in our own minds uh, how shocking all of this was. Uh, and then he's re required to explain, the, you know, what happened in terms of the gospel. So that's in verses 14 to 18 uh, that we won't read because basically it's the retelling of uh, uh, the episode that we just went through and went through the, uh, uh, the previous week. The only other detail we get there is this idea that uh, they're very clear of their anticipation. They were there waiting for someone to tell them how their sins could be forgiven, and we have the detail of the six witnesses uh, that Peter took with him. Uh, this leads to uh, verse 16 to 17, where P Peter is able to uh, uh, state that the entire experience rested on Scripture. I just think this is so, so important. That's what we see uh, in the book of Acts. Anytime there's something unusual that takes place, somebody jumps up and says, yeah, but this is what the Bible says. This is what was uh, spoken of by the prophet Joel. For example, in Acts chapter 2, and we have a similar phrase here, verse 16. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? How did this happen? Why did it happen? This is what Jesus said. Uh, and he, he relies on and looks to Scripture to substantiate a spiritual experience. Uh, and that's, that's so important. And, and obviously that's a problem today. You have people that have spiritual experiences, uh, and there are no Scriptures that they can point to to validate what has transpired. What do you do with that experience? Go, interesting. <laughs> And that's it. But, you know, we're, we're not going there because it's, uh, it's departure from, uh, from Scripture. Uh, but we don't see that here. We see a constant 
resting on the scriptures to explain the experience that had transpired. Uh, their reaction here, verse 18, and when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying that God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. It's not an old, it's, this old deal is not over yet. They're going to have a few more discussions about it and so forth. Uh, Peter's got a few more lessons to learn about it himself uh, from uh, the Apostle Paul personally. Uh, but the message here is the gospel to, uh, to the whole world. Uh, and like Peter, we said last week, he needed an attitude adjustment. And sometimes we do uh, as well. I thank God that we live in Hawaii. Uh, I, you know, uh, if you grew up in Hawaii, you should thank the Lord, not just because of the surf and the beauty, but because of the culture that you grew up in that is so accepting of people. Uh, it's, a, it's a Polynesian thing that, that other people that came here kind of adapted uh, into their lives culturally. Uh, and uh, and it's, uh, uh, if you don't know, it's not like that around the rest of the world. And you, it's, it's easy to forget, you know, and it's, uh, uh, you know, when, when you leave and you, and you go somewhere else. And, um, but uh, uh, we can thank the Lord for it because it's easy to develop Again, what one writer said, a caste system within our own lives. We pigeonhole people and we keep in a certain place. A man named Alan Emery wrote a book called Turtle on a Fence Post. Not, not sure where the title comes from, interesting though. But uh, he had worked in his own family business uh, until he was 45 years old and he talks about losing the business uh, and needing to just get a job, uh, any job. And he lived in a uh, city that had a big metropolitan hospital. Uh, he just needed to get a job quickly, get a little income coming in and so forth. He took a job as a janitor, uh, a lot of humility in that. Uh, but he says this uh, in that book, my first assignment was to work for two weeks as a houseman at a large metropolitan hospital. I was to mop the corridors, empty trash containers and clean ashtrays. While not in the best condition for this work, I completed the day schedule. The shock was not in the work, but in the general reaction of me as a person because of my green uniform and the kind of work I was doing. Not a single person responded to my good morning except others in the housekeeping department. I had never before experienced the caste system. That's the world we live in. And we need to make sure that we're in the world, but not of the world. You know, it's... Uh, Everybody's the same. Everybody needs the gospel. And uh, we might be shocked as to the people that are, are like Cornelius. Maybe they got a whole house full of people somewhere just waiting to hear how they can be forgiven of their, uh, of their, of their sins. Uh, and that's the reminder for us. I love this Quint, uh, Ken Hughes quote. He says, uh, if we do not believe the gospel is inclusive, it's for everybody. If we're not optimistic about what it will do, if we're not a little aggressive about sharing it, People will not come to Christ. Kind of, kind of an interesting little combination. We need to believe it's for everybody. We need to be optimistic about the power of the gospel. I mean, that's, uh, I'm going to read here from uh, uh, Romans 120 in a minute, but that's Paul saying. It is the power of God unto salvation. It changes people's lives dramatically. But they have to, we have to say the words. They have to hear the words. Of course, they have to uh, respond and so forth. Uh, but uh, we need to be optimistic uh, about the gospel uh, and the hope it can bring to someone's life. Here, here's, uh, excuse me, where Romans 1.16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And, uh, and I just think about, again, our opening illustration of Mahatma Gandhi and how, how the world could have been a different world today uh, if one guy in a church said, hey, brother, come on in here. I got a seat right here for you. Praise God, you're, you're here with us. Just a... Uh, what a, what a simple deal if uh, people had welcomed him in uh, to the family of God, a man that was apparently very close to receiving Christ. In fact, Gandhi again said in his autobiography, I like the New Testament. I like your Christianity, but I do not like your Christians. And that's, that's a problem, isn't it? And uh, we, we don't want that to be said. Of, we've all got our warts and imperfections, uh, but, you know, uh, God wants to change us. And sometimes we need an attitude adjustment in, in regards to people and God's love for them because the gospel is for the whole world.
blood of Jesus, the road is paved out a heavy price. Calling me, calling me, lift down my life. You gave a lift in me, you gave a lift in me over the fire, over the flood. You gave a lift in me, you So warm, cradle me, shelter me from the wild storm. Oh, I wrap myself in you, Lord. Cradle me, cover me. Moment by moment, the age is gone. On the shore, all this broken rock and battered stone. We cast our shadows and then we're gone. Lay it down, lay it down. Coming more like 
about grace. The word of grace I'll carry on, living life in it be now. The substance of your hope and love. The substance of your hope and love. Shining out. Shining out like a bright star in the dark. Standing strong, hanging on the Becoming more like you, 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 becoming more like you. Glory that's lifting me high. 